Our third and final session for today is titled New Social Movements, Black Lives Matter, and its Global Reverberations. And it's a pleasure to welcome Mina Kandasamy, activist, poet, novelist, and translator. Russell Rickford, Associate Professor of History at Cornell University, who joins us via Zoom. Ahmed Sekhanga, Ali A. Mazrui Senior Fellow at the Africa Institute Sharjah and Professor at Ohio State University. Kianga Yamahta Taylor, Professor in the Department of African American Studies at Princeton University, who also joins us via Zoom. And Suraj Yangde, Research Associate in the Department of African and African American Studies at Harvard. Our moderator is Elizabeth Georges, Associate Prof Professor of Art History, Theory, and Criticism at the Africa Institute, Sharjah. I would now like to hand over to the panelists. Okay, good afternoon. Um, so we have five speakers uh, today. Uh, so, I mean, initially we allotted only 50 minutes. I think I'm going to go with 20 minutes, 15. Uh, whatever, whoever can get it done in 15, that's fine, but I'm allotting 20 minutes. So. Welcome all. Um, so this, since the rise of post-colonialism as a theoretical construct and field of study associated with decolonization, new social movements have um, emerged mostly as uh, issue-oriented fronts and al alliances. So this panel will focus on movements, uh, including Black Lives Matter, uh, which has been fueled by anti-black uh, racism and structural inequalities uh, rooted in slavery and capitalism. So I begin, I give the floor to, I begin with in the order received by Mina, Mina Kanaski. So if you can begin. Uh, thanks to the Sharjah Art Foundation for giving me the space to speak about new social movements, Black Lives Matter, and this global reverberations. To claim this space, to claim this stage, to lay a claim to the conversation that we are about to embark on, I want to start with two lines of Tamil poetry and my translation of the same. Na markum kudiyallom, na manayan jom, naragatti lider padom, nadale illom. We are not the subjects of anyone. We do not fear the god of death. We shall not suffer were we to end in hell. We have no deception. We have no illusions. Na markum kudiyallom, na manayan jom, naragatti lider padom, nadale illom. Nobody is citizens and nobody is slaves. Fearless of lynchings and beheadings unscathed by the torrent of hell fires, we do not tremble at certain death. As people, we refuse to be ruled. As people, we refuse to die. As people, we refuse to suffer. As people, we refuse to be deceived. are lines from the classic Tamil poetry of the Bhakti poet Thirunavakkarasar who was persecuted by Mahendra Varman, the Jain Pallava emperor, for his faith in Shaivism. It's widely believed that these lines were sung when efforts were made to arrest him and produce him in Mahendra Varman's court. Because the seventh century Tamil of Upper is still in everyday use, and at the same time, some words include larger worlds of meaning, it opens up to all of these renderings, all of these translations. This declaration that we are not citizens or subjects is a radical slogan to throw in the face of a tyrannical state. It encapsulates the people rejection of subjugation as subjects. And Closer Home brings to mind the poet or the writer's disowning of association with a state. This reworked poem was written in response to the times when any critique of the Indian government faces the charge of sedition and terrorism. Of course, the question of citizenship or being subjects reminds us of colonialism and fascism. But the history of people resisting to be misgoverned goes way back in time. The oppressor changes. A seventh century king, later the British colonizers, the dark period of emergency, now a right-wing government clamoring to declare India as a Hindu Rashtra, a Hindu nation. The oppressor is a constantly shape-shifting entity power like a game of musical chairs, but people's resistance has always carried the same spirit of defiance. When I was asked to speak about the global reverberations of the Black Lives Matter movement, especially the protests that took place over the summer of 2020, I wanted to recall that as an Indian, it filled me with enormous hope. This protest seemed to offer a possibility 
in January and February 2020, ordinary Indians had started mobilizing against the amendment to the citizenship laws, against the decision to create the National Register of Citizens and the National Population Register. India's Northeast, especially the state of Assam, was acutely aware of what the measures could do and how easy it was to move someone to detention camps once the citizenship was made suspect. India's Home Minister Amit Shah made several open statements where he likened Bangladeshi migrants to termites and said they would be drowned in the Bay of Bengal. Protests erupted everywhere and they were often led by women, a majority of them Muslim, as in Shaheen Bagh. Their political awakening was a moment that overthrew the hegemonic narrative that Muslim women needed saviors. Likewise, equally powerful interventions came from Dalit political women like the Vidudalai Chirutegal Kachi, the Liberation Panthers Party in Tamil Nadu, or the Beam Army in Delhi, Uttar Pradesh, etc. What followed these citizenship protests was the Delhi pogrom, which targeted Muslim communities, where several BJP leaders openly shouted slogans of Goli Maro Salonko, meaning shoot the bastards. And this pogrom left at least 68 people dead, a vast majority of whom were Muslims. The violence included extreme incidents and targeting of Muslim owned property and mosques around the city. The beginning of the pandemic gave a perfect cover for the administration to clamp down all protests and prohibitory orders were passed under section 144 which made it illegal for more than four people to converge at a time. So immediately following this happening in you know, January, February 2020 and later in the summer when Black Lives Matter erupted. So watching the outpouring of people on the streets for Black Lives Matter gave fresh courage and hope to Indian people and social movements here. So instead of speaking in abstraction, I would like to talk about the reaction of the Vidudalai Chirutegal Kachi, the Liberation Panthers Party, the largest Dalit mass movement in South India, and presently a political party. Although the um, elected representatives include only two members of parliament and four legislators to the Tamil Nadu Assembly, the Keda base in Tamil Nadu is massive. The party stands for five core objectives, caste annihilation, women's liberation, proletarian liberation, linguistic nationalism, and anti-imperialist struggle. I personally have been involved over the last two decades in their work, in my work as a translator, and subsequently as a writer activist, taking part in and chronicling their protests. So the VCK organized several online meetings, public gatherings were banned all over India at that point in time, in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. Here, I present my translation of excerpts from the speeches of VCK, Party's founder, president, and member of parliament, Dr. Tol Tirumavalavan. Uh, this one dates from the 26th of July, 2020. And uh, I present these uh, without much of a preface because I just want to uh, speak about how does somebody who's running a Dalit mass movement for 30 years look at Black Lives Matter and what are the lessons that he draws from them and also conveys to his keda. So I'm not prefacing them, but you know, obviously it's, it's very transparent. So speaking about Black Lives Matter solidarity events organized around the globe and the sheer numbers, Dr. Tirumavalavan pointed out, I would like to highlight that while racial discrimination is spoken about globally and is an international issue, caste discrimination has not had the same reception or treatment. We spent 21 days in Durban in 2001 at the World Conference Against Racism campaigning on this issue. We didn't take part in the plenaries. We were demonstrating outside the venues of these plenaries, drawing attention to the issue of caste discrimination, fighting for it to also be recognized on par with racial discrimination. We went on hunger strikes. We demonstrated with placards. We distributed pamphlets. We have to make the international community also realize that Dalit lives matter. The international community must recognize this problem as an international problem. Caste has managed to flourish for so long because it has been hidden away. With the advent of social media, we are not at anyone's mercy anymore. No one, no force on earth can bury this. No one can hide the atrocities. We will bring everything to light. Uh, and the second portion that I have chosen to translate and present is the question of solidarity and the absence of non-Dalits when it comes to Dalit atrocities. And again, I begin to quote him. When we look at America, we look at it as a capitalist society, a capitalist culture of consumption and individualism. And yet, 
Even in that extremely capitalist society, white people came to the streets in solidarity with black people. It shows that there are democratic forces among white people. It shows that there were democratic approaches and tendencies even within a capitalist, imperialist nation. We have never seen that in India. A non-Dalit coming to the streets for an atrocity against a Dalit. There is no perspective here of being a democratic force. When the Dalit is affected, Dalits alone have to struggle. There has never been a history of a Mudaliyar caste group or a Reddiyar caste group coming in support of Dalit people when they are affected. Worse, they do not even come and participate as individuals. I want to point out that we are at a social point where contradictions have not been sharpened as Dalits versus non-Dalits. 50 years ago, there was a major struggle in Tamil Nadu between Brahmins and non-Brahmins. The contradictions came to the fore and the non-Brahmin movement strengthened itself. Though they have been at the receiving end of discrimination, non-Brahmins are not ready to fight for Dalits or Adivasis except for one or two periodist organizations. Elsewhere, there might be one or two rare individuals, and these are the exceptions that prove the rule. Um, and the third, um, the third distinction, that he, uh, the com commonality that he draws between the two struggles, and the commonalities of the struggle, seeing Black Lives Matter, and the movement of, for caste annihilation as anti-fascist struggles. Fascism as a phenomenon is manifesting itself around the world. In Trump's America, it manifested as racial discrimination, white supremacy, and state terrorism. In India, it manifests itself as caste discrimination. But the basic underlying feature is fascistic in its core. All liberation struggles are struggles against fascism. In the US, it is the black struggle. In India, it's the Dalit struggle, the Adivasi struggle around the world. It is the struggle of women against patriarchy. Anti-fascism is not only meant for black people. Dalits are also anti-fascist. Women are also anti-fascist. Martin Luther King, and then he brings this comparison between a figurehead of the African-American or black emancipatory movement and compares him with Ambedkar. Martin Luther King fought against the fascism that went by the name of white supremacy. Ambedkar fought against fascism that went by the name of Sanatan Dharma or the caste system. Sanatan Dharma is nothing but Indian fascism. Those who oppose it are Ambedkarites. Dr. Martin Luther King spoke of liberation. He fought against racial discrimination to destroy racial inequality within a nation. Dr. Ambedkar, on the other hand, struggled to build a nation out of an anti-democratic, unequal, unfree, oppressive society where ruthless caste East fanatics are in power, where birth-based discrimination is the social order, he wanted to demolish the society that had been based on Sanatan for thousands of years, and he wanted to establish and create a new nation out of the social horror that was existing. The old nation had to be destroyed for the new to be born, the new to be built. And finally, I also conclude uh, with something else that uh, we can later open up for debate, where he says, uh, uh, where there's both the humility and acceptance of reality to say, we cannot always copy or replicate the techniques of the black struggle here. There are two different ground realities, there are two different struggles, but we will stand together and in solidarity with the black people, we'll fight against fascist forces everywhere. So moving from um, this, um, what did the Black Lives Matter movement mean to uh, Dalit mass movements in India, I want to speak a little bit about the other, the big theme of the conference, which was the afterlives of the post-colonial, and want to actually say that in many ways, neoliberal Hindutva is nothing but a kind of East India Company 2.0. So neoliberal Hindutva has inherited and wrested back all the oppressive machinery and structures of the colonizers. Every textbook strategy of the colonizer is being copied and implemented. So you have colonial era sedition laws employed against university students, against pro-democracy protesters, against journalists. The threat of punishment and imprisonment under these stringent laws serves the purpose of silencing people. Likewise, one of the strongest weapons in the hands of imperialism, which is anti-terrorism laws, are also arbitrarily deployed at the drop of a hat to criminalize Dalit and human rights activists, anti-mining activists, etc. 
This is something I don't have the scope to completely go into, but I'm just going to highlight on why I would call neoliberal Hindutva's East India Company 2.0, which is just look at these two big billionaires, Adani and Ambani, and how, how is it different from extractive colonialism. Adani alone controls six airports. He controls 12 ports on the east and the west coast of India. Recently, he also acquired, in January 2022, the train line from Sargoja and Chhattisgarh to enable the direct transport of coal from the mine to his port. He's already India's largest private coal miner. And it's not, Adani's business interests are not only in India, so he's also involved in Australia, he's involved in Myanmar, and around the world. And also the question is, how do you link Adani and Ambani with the disaster capitalism that we witnessed during the pandemic? So the increase in the wealth of the top 11 billionaires of India during the pandemic could sustain the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme for 10 years or the Indian Health Ministry for 10 years. So this kind of shows the proportion of money that they made. And why are people who fight for social justice, people who fight or represent the caste annihilation movement, why are they against this kind of unbridled capitalism is because it will end up removing the fig leaf of social justice or what goes by the name of reservation in India and the welfare state that exists. And uh, one of the biggest mass movements that did take place in India after beginning at least in September 2020 and extending until the repeal of the three neoliberal farm laws in November 2021 was the farmer struggle. More than a thousand farmers lost their lives. Uh, their movements, the uh, Modi's government sought to crush their movement by the sheer brute force of the police machinery and often also brought in the paramilitary. There was a complete um, infiltration of the state apparatus by those on the right wing. And, uh, but the farmers were relentless. They just did not back down. And in fact, because of the polls or elections coming up in Punjab, as well as um, just the fact that you know they would not back off, Modi's government was forced to its knees and had to repeal the laws. Uh, I also think that you know new, new social movements may not even always take the shape of large-scale people's mobilization because something else that's happening, which again mimics the colonial structure, is the way in which the central government, uh, the union government led by BJP, has started using the post of the governor, which existed, to kind of rule every state by proxy, in which the people's aspiration of elected representatives from the state is overridden by the governor who is controlled by the center. And moving on from both of these uh, topics, so in the, in the linked way, I also want to talk about what does decolonialism mean in India today? And what do we name an oppressor who shares your passport and your skin color, practices all the horrors of colonialism, but speaks the language of diversity and decolonialism? How does one perform the urgent political task of exposing this performative political posturing? So let me begin by listing out some of the things which are hugely problematic and oppressive in my cultural universe, especially when it concerns sexuality, the strictures of caste and endogamy, the regimentation of bodies, the terror that surrounds love, especially love that does not meet socially permissible, permissible copulations. Because these are ever-present discriminations that cannot be blamed on colonialism alone, because it does not augur well for a society to lay all the blame for its disintegration at the doorstep of colonialism. Such an attitude, which is often practiced by you know, revisionist Hindutva, which blames only the external oppressor, is dangerous because it prevents introspection, it prevents reform. By diverting attention elsewhere, it throttles the space for revolution from within the ranks. Also, such finger pointing and outsourcing all the ills of society makes the case easier for Hindu right wing groups and the historical revisionism. It allows the us versus them debates. The claim that we were different, we were an open society, and it was the British who came and ruined us, a narrative that unites right wing, hatred filled nationalists uh, and lazy um, liberals, means that in the 75 years since the British left, how have we shown that we are different? So to blame the British without acknowledging the horrors of caste and caste patriarchy, which existed for hundreds of years before their arrival, is convenient whitewashing, as in using the white oppressor or colonizer to cover up for what was deeply rotten and wounded in our society. So the urge, what I would call the urgent political task is resisting the right-wing appropriation of decolonization. There is a danger that the discourse around decolonization is completely appropriated by the right-wing in India, 
or in other previously colonized countries, where it maintains an where it remains an academic project, decolonization panders to white guilt, to the white savior complex of seeking absolvement or the learning experience and the forgive me father for have sinned moment of performance that will allow them to walk around with washed hands. But sometimes in a sinister manner, decolonization functions as a smoke bomb. There's drama and distraction, it's entertaining, and it's even the current trend as far as circus routines go. But it's necessary to watch what happens when the tent is smoke-filled. Where decolonization is about tangibles, there's the promise of drama. There's the spectacle of return, the rhetoric of restitution. But where decolonization is about intangibles like education, culture, politics, civil rights, there is the promise of tragedy. So one day the BJP submits before, uh, submits to the Supreme Court that the fabled Kohinoor diamond was gifted to the queen. And the next day when they are pulled up by the high court, they face a loss of face and argue that the gift was a theft because the Maharaja who gave it away was a minor at the time. So a single diamond becomes emblematic of national pride. This is low stakes, performative decolonization on which the left and the right, you and me, can all agree to agree. The dangerous variant is where decolonization is pushed forward as a corrective by right wing. This is a classic parallel of religious right-wing right religious terrorism. The anti-imperialist, anti-Western facade of ISIS and Taliban are no different from the anti-imperialist, anti-Western line of the BJP RSS. So in India, we are living in a bizarre world where the terror accused in the Malegao blast case, Sadhvi Pragya, is called as an eminent speaker at an educational institution and asked to speak about how to get out of the colonial mindset. An actual terrorist becomes an intellectual in this new order of things and wields decolonization as her weapon. Meanwhile, the real intellectuals, the real moral compasses and conscience keepers of our society are locked up in jail under terrorism charges. Look at the Bhima Koregaon 16. This is such, such a shameful inversion of things, how things ought to be and how they actually are. So in, likewise, introducing the new education policy, the Indian education minister said, the biggest challenge facing the education system and the government was figuring out how to decolonize the Indian mind. One of Hindutva's fiercest ideological opponents, um, the, uh, the founder president of the VCK, the Liberation Panthers Party I earlier spoke about, faults the NEP, the national education policy, as attempting to establish caste-based education in India. Uh, I quote him again, the national education policy imposes the three language formula. It imposes hereditary education. They are introducing public exams at so many levels so that students drop out of education and go back to their hereditary occupations. They are creating a compulsory nationwide entrance exam for students to enter college. The children of fisher people are no longer fishing. The children of goldsmiths don't make jewelry. The children of shoemakers don't make shoes. Barbers are no longer doing their hereditary jobs. This is a list that I can keep on expanding. This is the fear of the Sangh Parivar, the RSS. Who will do these jobs which have been done hereditarily for ages and ages? What will happen if all these do not continue? At the heart of the RSS ideology is the principle that India should not be a 100% literate educated nation. This is not a mere surmise, my comrades. This is the dream plan. Uh, so coming back to it, what is being dressed up as decolonization by the Hindu majoritarian BJP government is a return to the oppressive caste system which discriminates people on the basis of descent and which ordains work through hereditary caste work. This rejection of the Western by Hindutva forces under the politically correct language of decolonization prepares a fertile ground for fascism. India's Home Minister Amit Shah has said on record that Western standards of human rights should not be applied to matters pertaining to India. Imposing a communications blockade in Kashmir after revoking the state's special constitutional status in August 2019 in order to further the Hindutva agenda of corporate-sponsored settler colonialism, Shah has go gone on to justify this saying, people are trying to create a hue and cry over lack of mobile connection for a few days. Lack of phone connection is not a human rights violation. So this is how it flows. We will decolonize the Indian mind, meaning human rights is Western, meaning Western standards of human rights do not apply in India, meaning a communications blackout is not a human rights violation. 
When progressive discourse is co-opted to justify a regressive, oppressive, and hegemonic politics, we have the collective responsibility to be in a state of constant alacrity. We have the responsibility to call out, to demarcate boundaries, to refuse to allow this catastrophic misuse of political terminology. We do not want the pretext of decolonization used by the right wing to fund our children's enslavement or to perpetuate a settler colonialism. Jai Beam. Thank you, Mina. So then our next speaker is Russell Rickford, uh, a professor of history from Cornell University. He's joining us remotely. Uh, Russell? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, it's good to be with you. It's quite early in the morning here. I understand it's afternoon over there. Uh, I want to say thank you um, to the organizers and to my uh, fellow uh, panelists, some familiar faces, and, uh, and some new friends that I'm meeting. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mina. Um, uh, those were marvelous expressions of uh, of, of anti-fascist uh, solidarity. Indeed, uh, Dalit Lives Matter. And you know, incidentally, we have been uh, having a debate within the U.S. Um, about the appropriateness of the paradigm of uh, caste uh, as a description uh, for structural racism. But far too often, these uh, conversations exclude the. Um, uh, the realities of, of the Dalits. So I'm grateful for this uh, intervention. Um, uh, so like other popular democratic movements around the world, uh, BLM arose amid overlapping social crises, uh, Black Lives Matter, that is. Uh, racial terror became the nucleus of modern protest, forged by the contradictions of racist state violence BLM was re-energized and radicalized by the gruesome footage of George Floyd's death, one of the most chilling public acts of murder in memory. The outrage that fueled BLM also stemmed from the routine violence endemic to racial capitalism. Vast segments of black and brown America struggled to survive in the shadows of, of affluence. Many such citizens dwelled in underserved, over-policed neighborhoods, domains of both extreme surveillance and systemic neglect. Uh, even before the pandemic, BLM's constituencies confronted the layered crises of a system that renders whole populations expendable. Mass incarceration, unemployment, underemployment, lack of health care, the effects of militarism and ecological catastrophe ravaged populations of color, virulent racism resurfaced in the form of white nationalist rallies, anti-immigration vigilantism, the homicidal hatred of Charleston, South Carolina shooter Dylan Roof, and the fascist rhetoric of Donald Trump. The bitterness that had long festered as billionaires plundered our social wealth and relegated the poor and precarious to a gutted social landscape finally erupted. BLM furnished a potent alternative to political immobility and despair. The movement revitalized mass protest in the US uh, and in many ways beyond. It challenged the acquiescence and moderate reformism that had crippled progressive forces since the election of Obama. BLM popularized an anti-racist vocabulary and analysis. It helped reconstruct a mass critique of both racial oppression and economic exploitation. Uh, BLM forged alliances. The movement helped energize popular movements for indigenous rights, economic justice, environmental repair. It unfolded amid a wave of mass struggle that included teacher strikes, water protector mobilizations, uh, attempts to organize Amazon warehouses and fast food chains. Fees must fall, roads must fall, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if we embrace a broader time frame, we might glimpse in BLM resonances of earlier mobilizations, including the anti-globalization efforts and Occupy Wall Street demonstrations of the early 2000s. Within and beyond the US, BLM activists and anti-racist activists engaged in productive exchanges with embattled groups, including undocumented folks, indigenous people. In short, the tides of anti-racist protest mingled with wider currents.
the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor uprisings would not have been as widespread or as prolonged had they not arisen against a backdrop of grassroots agitation, COVID, and spiraling precarity. Perhaps the most significant BLM achievements lay in the realm of social consciousness. BLM demonstrations produced an alternative framework of knowledge. They offered a way to break psychologically from the old regime and reconstruct popular awareness. BLM helped ordinary people question existing social arrangements. Galvanized by the crisis of state violence, many of the movement's participants developed a broader social critique. They came to reject the notion of an economy, indeed a democracy, predicated on desperation, debt, punishment, and war. BLM popularized formerly marginal ideas from police defunding to prison abolition. As they joined in grassroots protests, some activists were moved to ask, what would it mean, what would it take to build a society in which no one is desperate, in which there is no need for the threat of state violence? One sign of BLM's influence was the tremendous backlash it provoked. The mechanisms of repression included attacks on protesters and journalists, the ongoing militarization of police, and the revival of anti-communist scare tactics. Um, and of course, uh, as has already been suggested, um, you know, these acts of repression um, extended well beyond the United States. Uh, we witnessed the collective punishment of anti-racist dissent, uh, even as far-right movements freely promoted white nationalism uh, and xenophobia. The demonization of critical race theory, particularly in the United States, the FBI's fabricated category of black identity extremists, and the cynical counter slogans, all lives matter and blue lives matter, were part of larger efforts to discredit anti-racist struggle and suppress a structural critique of white supremacy. BLM also generated subtler attempts to subvert anti-racism, including the proliferation of what I call rituals of racial enlightenment, scrambling to regain the balance of power and restore the veneer of moral legitimacy the corporate and political establishments offered symbolic and superficial and quite frankly cynical affirmations of BLM. Managers of the status quo attempted to bureaucratize and co-opt anti-racist revolt. They hoped to funnel radical energy back into the cul-de-sac of electoral politics, to cast anti-racism as personal self-help or as shifts in individual behavior rather than as efforts to dismantle racial capitalism. So Mina has talked about uh, performative liberation and neoliberal decolonization. Uh, in the United States, we have the diversity and inclusion regime, which exists to convert demands for racial justice into a kind of moral theater. Nevertheless, in 2020, BLM emerged as the cutting edge of struggle in many parts of the world. Popular repudiation of racist state violence and anti-Blackness became global frameworks for mass protests. Millions of people recognized racial violence or began to recognize racial violence as a byproduct of a system that renders human beings disposable. They began to see racism not just as evidence of intolerance, but as a mechanism for expropriating land, dividing and exploiting labor, accumulating capital, and controlling foreign and domestic markets. Uh, in short, people began to acknowledge that the whole system is rotten. Uh, BLM became a universal grammar of dissent, a way to name an international order rooted in expanding security and carceral regimes on one hand and shrinking public sectors and social programs on the other. Tales of America's racial atrocities reverberated throughout the world as they did at the height of the Cold War. Reports of police slayings of African-Americans galvanized Black Brazilians. International watchdog groups condemned racist American policing. Anti-Blackness in the US became a touchstone for anti-racist campaigns overseas. Parallel movements erupted in Canada, the Netherlands, Israel, New Zealand, Colombia, the UK, et cetera, et cetera. The global George Floyd demonstrations reinvigorated efforts to remove statues, flags, another iconography associated with racism, enslavement, colonialism, and genocide. From Chicago to the British city of Bristol, 
protesters attacked monuments to white supremacy and Western conquest. In 2016, Vision for Black Lives platform noted that, quote, as oppressed people living in the US, the belly of global empire, we are in a critical position to build the necessary connections for a global liberation movement, unquote. BLM had helped revitalize radical black internationalism. Many of the movement's participants rejected the myth of American exceptionalism. They refused to view US democracy as a unique model for the world. Rather, they saw the US as Ida B. Wells and W.E.B. Du Bois and Fannie Lou Hamer had seen it as a regime rooted in the same structures of exploitation and conquest that upheld many other empires. The new internationalism bolstered black Palestinian solidarities. During the uprising in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, after the police killing of Mike Brown, Palestinians in the occupied territories tweeted advice to black demonstrators about surviving tear gas attacks. In recent years, African-Americans have played key roles in efforts to express solidarity with Palestinians. I shouldn't say just in recent years, but certainly in recent years, there's been growing uh, visibility among African-American uh, solidarity with Palestine. BLM raised critical questions about the global dimensions of justice. Who is the oppressor? Who is the oppressed? Who is the colonizer? Who are the colonized? What are the connections between settler colonialism in Israel, South Africa, and the US? How do these historical relationships shape the mechanisms of imperialism, militarism, and global capitalism today? Brazilian educator Paulo Ferrer called the process of developing a critical awareness of social reality conscientization. But such consciousness is rarely triggered by polite dialogue. Rather, it is awakened by mass struggle. White supremacy is never fully exposed until it is confronted in the streets. So I'm short on time, I'll move to conclude. Uh, the BLM movement was ideologically diverse. It contained many complexities and contradictions. And I hope that we can uh, discuss these um, in the, in the uh, Q and A. Uh, Kiangi Amada Taylor and I were uh, talking right before the program about some of these contradictions. Uh, even the George Floyd uprising uh, encompass, ele encompass elements of both radicalism and moderate reformism. Some organizers were willing to cultivate ties to the Democratic Party and to move into the narrow realm of electoral politics. Others rejected any trace of collaboration with the ruling classes. Uh, the pandemic has uh, postponed uh, or, or uh, perhaps destroyed uh, a decisive struggle between BLM's radical and moderate tendencies. In any case, BLM's critical phases of growth and evolution probably lie in the past. Its life cycle as a movement may be all but complete. Many people of conscience have slipped back into survival mode, unable to muster the collective energy needed to build a future beyond racial capitalism. The world awaits more sustained insurrections of the vulnerable, the exploited, and the abandoned. Still, we are living in an extraordinary moment of historical transition. As the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci said, the old world is dying and the new world is struggling to be born. Taken collectively, sovereignty battles in Puerto Rico, social justice movements in Oaxaca, indigenous and ecological struggles in the Americas, anti-austerity revolts in Europe and Africa, anti-racist mobilizations, uh, including BLM, may signal the advent of a new age of rebellion. Populist rage against oppression and economic insecurity is overflowing. Ordinary people are rejecting the boundaries of permissible politics, of politics as usual. Their outburst against predatory capitalism must be understood as more than isolated skirmishes. The masses are demanding a new social contract. They are sketching the outlines of a world beyond neoliberalism. As a global system continues to generate popular discontent in the periphery and centers of capitalism, more popular movements will emerge. Demands for a reorganization of modern life will intensify. The spirit of revolt is contagious. A transformative shift is underway. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Russell. The next speaker is uh, Professor Ahmed Shikenya, who is a fellow at the, at the Africa Institute, the Ali Majrui Global Fellow, Senior Fellow. He's a professor of history at Ohio State University. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you for staying after such a long day. I know some of you came from long flights, and so if you fall asleep, by, no problem. Um, okay, my uh, presentation deals with uh, the impact of uh, Black Lives Matter and racial justice, how it's reflected here in this part of the world, in the Middle East, uh, especially in the Arabia, and the Persian Gulf, North Africa, so. So uh, it has generated a great deal of debate about uh, the region's history, uh, the legacy of its slavery, and so forth. So I decided to focus mainly on the debate about slavery and its legacy uh, in the Middle East, focusing mainly on Arabia and the Persian Gulf. That's part of uh, my current research project on slavery, oil, and wage labor focusing mainly on Qatar. Um, so there, uh, uh, before I start the, uh, talking about the debate, uh, just the basic facts about uh, the evolution of slavery in the Middle East. Uh, we know that like the rest of the world, uh, slavery in the Middle East goes back to the uh, ancient times before the rise of Islam and after the rise of Islam. Uh, what is important is that uh, Slavery in the Middle East before the rise of Islam continued, I mean, there's an element of continuity. What happened is that with the rise of Islam, the practice was recognized. Islamic law uh, developed certain rules uh, governing the practice of slavery, for instance, uh, deciding who is enslavable and who is not. Uh, what are the rights and the limits of uh, enslaved people? Uh, mechanism for manumission, several ways. Um, another important fact is, which is very often overlooked, is the majority of slaves in the Middle East be before the rise of Islam and after, uh, the majority came from actually Eastern Europe, uh, Persia, uh, Central Asia, what is called white slaves or Sakaliba. Uh, but another major source, one of the oldest sources, of course, is uh, the Horn of Africa, the proximity between Arabia just across the Red Sea, mainly uh, ancient Nubia, present-day northern Sudan, as well as Ethiopia, Somalia, and these uh, regions. Now, uh, in the 19th century, beginning 18th, 19th century, actually the slave trade peaked uh, at a time when it was abolished in the Atlantic world. Uh, and this was mainly due to the changes in the global economy, uh, especially in the Gulf with the development of the pearling industry, as well as the production of this. This is the subject of uh, Matthew Hopper's uh, book, uh, Slaves of One Master. Uh, so it, it, instead of debating slavery as, you know, there's the, an the assumption among historians that uh, slaves in the Middle East just because people love to have slaves. In the, um, Matthew Hooper and many others who start working on the Indian Ocean uh, have start looking at the productive roles of, of slaves. But uh, uh, since actually, say, the, the publication of uh, Bernard Lewis, Race and Slavery in the Middle East, there has been a great deal of debate among Western scholars uh, about the nature of slavery in the region. And most of this debate focused on key issues. For framing slavery. Is it Arab? Is it Muslim? Uh, recently, people frame it within uh, Indian Ocean slave system. Um, defining what is slavery itself. Uh, the other issue is the fact that uh, slavery persisted in this region well into the 20th century. And of course, this happened also in Africa as well and many other places. Uh, and uh, the question is, why did it exist uh, until mid 20th century. For instance, if you look at the Middle East, uh, slavery was abolished in Bahrain in 1937. Uh, it was abolished in Qatar in 1952. 
uh, in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in 1963, in Oman in 1971. Uh, so that became one. But the issue that I want to focus on is uh, Western scholars have lamented the fact that despite the long history of slavery in the Middle East, uh, there is uh, a silence about uh, this uh, topic. It's considered a taboo and so forth. So this is what I really want to focus on is the assumption. Uh, first, as I said, regarding the definition, one of the main questions is whether to compare uh, slavery in the Middle East with that in the Atlantic. For instance, uh, Gwen Campbell, who is a leading historian of slavery in uh, the Indian Ocean, and he said there is a scholarly consensus as to the meaning of slavery in the Indian Ocean world. And he also went on to say that uh, with the exception of the plantation economies in, uh, in, in, in the islands of Southern Indian Ocean, uh, there was rarely any form of plantation slavery. Um, uh, this was a source of his, uh, this quote in his book, The Structure of Slavery in the Indian Ocean. Uh, Ohio Toledano, who wrote about the Ottoman, slavery in the Ottoman Empire, um, it basically, he uh, placed all these diverse categories of slaves as kind of a continuum of various degrees of bondage rather than a dichotomy between slave uh, and free. Uh, so there was a, a, a great deal. What I want to focus on is that uh, there is a great deal of literature written in Arabic uh, that uh, came out, but really nobody paid attention to. Um, just before I got into this book, uh, for instance, at the turn of the century, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, there was a great deal of debate among what they call the Salafiya movement. These are basically uh, Muslim scholars, ulama, uh, theologians, who began to debate the abolition of slavery and so forth. So it became a matter of debate between Salafi reformist and more conservative uh, uh, ulama or the establishment. Um, so this is just a list of books that came out uh, during the past few decades. You have this Muhammad Abdul Wahab, Rit for Islam, Slavery in Islam. Uh, Hamid Shafiq it was talking about, uh, the translation is, Islam is a liberator uh, of slaves. Uh, Abdul Nasser, uh, the position of Islam towards slavery. Uh, another Ben uh, al-Islam, uh, al-Islam wal al al-Ukhra, that's also slavery in Islam and in other nations. And some people focus on a certain category of slaves. For instance, the Egyptian writer Najwa Kamal focused on uh, the, what they call the Jawari, uh, or meaning female slaves and young boys in Egypt in the medieval period. Uh, this is a work on eunuchs in uh, Arabia. Uh, and also you have uh, one of the topics that attracted a lot of attention was the Zeng Rebellion, the slave rebellion that happened in uh, Basra in Baghdad in the 9th century AD. Uh, here another uh, book by Muhammad Abdul Ghani Sabbagh. Uh, and then uh, also, uh, this, this is an important point here, that uh, there, was, there was no consensus uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, with the rise of Arab nationalism. Uh, you have a group of people who began to critique the practice of slavery, especially in Saudi Arabia and other places. Uh, and um, it became a matter. So this is a book by the Secretary General of the Sudanese Communist Party, uh, Mohammed Ibrahim Lugutub. Uh, died in uh, around 2011, uh, and he talks about the uh, evolution of slavery in, uh, in the Sudan. However, I think that one of the most important areas that needs to be looked at is the representation of slavery in literature. Uh, and the subject actually has been uh, the focus of several novels, one of the most prominent writers from Saudi Arabia, who's also a journalist, is Mahmoud Tarawri uh, of uh, West African descent, 
uh, who is formerly my name. He um, wrote several novels. One of them was called Maimuna. It's a story of uh, a West African family who migrated from West Africa uh, at the turn, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, during a time when West Africa was in turmoil. You have uh, the end of the slave trade, the beginning of European colonialism. And they came to Mecca, uh, and the father, of course, this is an old tradition that people want to be close to the uh, holy uh, sites of Islam and spend their, the rest of their life there. And then in Mecca, uh, the father went to, on a trip to Jerusalem, uh, and his brother, who was living in Mecca at the time, uh, was wandering around, and he was kidnapped by uh, uh, some Bedouins. Uh, so the story is about his e experiment, his experience as an enslaved person. Another uh, novel by Sraouri called Akhdar Ud al Gana is a story about a film uh, director and a photographer who went to uh, West Africa, went to Senegal, to uh, Gori Island to make a film about the Atlantic slave trade. So it was full of dialogue about uh, uh, racism uh, and so forth. And uh, it, it was one of the, uh, became uh, one of the most popular uh, books. And the last one, which is quite interesting, uh, is uh, an, a novel called Kalbum in Bangalore by uh, Saif al Islam Ibn Saud. This is the son of the Saudi king Ibn Saud, who ruled in the 1950s and so on. And it tells the story, actually, it was bi biography of his mother who was kidnapped from Balochistan in uh, Persian Iran, uh, brought, uh, just like in early 1920s, brought across the Gulf and was sold in Eastern Arabia and ended up being uh, one of the wives of the Saudi ruler. So it's, a, it's an intriguing story and it, it draws attention to uh, a neglected aspect and that is the enslavement of Balochis, uh, especially from you know, the area between Iran and, uh, uh, the, the, and, and Pakistan. Uh, and this is mainly in the 1920s, 1930s, when the supply of slaves from East Africa uh, dwindled. Uh, this region became one of the major sources uh, of slaves, especially in the uh, country of Oman. Um, now, after the, uh, so the, it, 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 it really tells the story and shed a, a lot of light on the mechanics of the slave trade uh, and the involvement of the British and so forth. So um, I think these novels are very important, uh, and especially if we're talking about the silence about slavery, I find, as a historian, I find this quite useful in terms of uh, giving insights into the experiences of uh, enslaved people. There is a great deal of uh, material, especially after uh, the Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd story, and so especially it generated a lot of debate, and you find a lot of material on YouTube uh, and social media. Uh, so, as a historian, I think we have to look at different sources that uh, will give insight into the experience of enslavement. So, I'll stop here. Thank you. That was short and sweet. <laughs> so our next speaker is uh, Professor Kianga Yamata. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly because I don't want sure. uh, people to destroy my name too. So uh, <laughs> Professor of um, African American Studies at Princeton University. She's joining us remotely. Uh, can we? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Hello, Professor Kianga? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, but. Okay, so I'll, I'll get started then. Okay, um, we can hear you, okay. Great. I also would like to extend thanks um, uh, for the invitation to participate um, and offer my words in the spirit of provocation and I hope to have a, a good conversation. Um, 
Last month, February, in the United States was Black History Month. Um, and it began with 16 historically black colleges and universities under shelter in place orders after receiving multiple bomb threats. There was the ongoing and escalating efforts to ban books and teaching curriculum related to what the right in the United States has erroneously described as critical race theory, even prompting some white parents in Alabama to complain about the recognition of Black History Month itself. Before the first week of February ended, a young Black man named Amir Locke was killed by Minneapolis police who entered the apartment he was sleeping in unannounced and shot him while he lay on a couch. Locke was not the target of the, quote, no-knock uh, police warrant that allowed the police to enter the apartment where he was staying. Days later, hundreds of protesters filled the streets of Minneapolis to once again raise their voices in opposition to deadly police violence, just as they had done for Philando Castile in the summer of 2016, and George Floyd in the summer of 2020. For 10 years, the US has been locked in an anguished cycle of anger and despair, fueled by the premature deaths of black women, men, and children at the hands of police in cities across the country, and also fueled by the persistence of racial inequality throughout the iterations of Black Lives Matter. It has been 10 years since George Zimmerman murdered Trayvon Martin catalyzing a new movement against police race, uh, racial police violence. In what initially began as an effort to arrest and indict Zimmerman, it has evolved into a much broader social movement that would, allow, that would not only challenge racism in the criminal justice system, but would come to embrace the slogan, Black Lives Matter, to articulate the extent to which the lives of ordinary Black people had been made disposable. By the summer of 2020, when tens of millions of ordinary Americans filled the streets to decry racism, the New York Times declared that Black Lives Matter was the largest social movement in American history. Nearly two years after a summer when almost 5,000 demonstrations took place, marking the crest of the movement for Black Lives, Many of the same issues that propelled the movement for Black lives into existence remain steadfast. The protests were catalyzed by the murder of Floyd, but their longevity was sustained by the deep inequitable realities of American life that had been brutally exposed by the inept and unequal responses to the pandemic. Bailouts for corporations, contrasted to meager cash assistance begrudgingly dispensed by elected officials, dysfunctional and archaic communications between states and the federal government slowed the production of desperately needed personal protection equipment. The arbitrary designation of essential employees thrust most vulnerable workers into the front line revealing the fragility of workplace protections and the paucity of benefits like sick days or sick pay. The promises of free treatment for COVID only raised old unsettled questions of why healthcare in general could not also be covered by the state. The fault lines of race and class splintered across communities with real life and death consequences most crudely distinguished between those forced to interact with the public and those allowed to work from their homes. The 2020 demonstrations became cathartic expressions of collective grievance as millions took refuge in the solidarities of fear and vulnerability created by the unprecedented pandemic. Racism and the violent excesses of the criminal justice system mapped onto these patterns of inequality that had been exposed by the uneven response to the pandemic. But two years after these historic, but nearly two years after these historic protests in the summer of 2020, the movement for Black Lives now faces existential questions about its continuation. I, I say this not because a movement against racism is no longer necessary, 
but because its stated aims to end police abuse and violence in Black communities, as well as to end the conditions that give rise to the pretext of police in our communities continue. This is hardly surprising, but it begs the question of whether there are different strategies and tactics that can achieve the movement's goals, or at least bring it closer to them. And beyond the issues of strategy and tactics are the questions of politics in terms of how we understand the persistence of these features of racism and inequality in our society and the social forces capable and incapable of, unending, of upending these systemic features within a capitalist society. It would be wrong to say that nothing has changed in the last 10 years of the movement for Black Lives. And I'll just say that I think that um, many of the transformations or the, uh, the, the changes that Russell alluded to um, in his comments that I wholeheartedly agree with. Um, not only did the movement expose racism as a core feature of American society, but it normalized the observation of systemic racism, moving the popular understanding far beyond individual bigotry. In terms of tangible changes, city and state governments across the country have passed various kinds of bills with the stated intention of reforming the police. By May of 2020, more than 700 police reform bills had been introduced across the country. And by the end of the year, nearly 100 had been enacted. Across the country, there have been minor and major efforts to disrupt the status quo in the criminal justice system, including attempts to end cash bail, decriminalizing marijuana possession, and other strategies uh, that are referred to as decarceration in the US. These efforts have been buttressed by a handful of campaigns to elect so-called reform prosecutors. When Michelle Alexander's The New Jim, Grow, Jim Crow helped to galvanize liberals and shed light on the catastrophic consequences of the country's decades-long pursuit of punishment in the form of imprisonment, the movement for Black lives provided the threat of social and political instability inherent to social movements to coerce public officials to act. But the emergence of defund the police as a central demand of the movement in 2020 was also indicative of how little reform had permeated the whole of American society. Defund was not the product of youthful, uh, of youthful petulance as it was described by politicians and the punditry. Instead, it reflected the maturation of organizers who had been witness to the failure of earlier efforts that focused on body cameras and federal consent decrees to rein in police. It was evidence that some portion of the movement had radicalized and concluded that reform of the police was no longer possible. But raising the essential question again, what and who are the social forces necessary to compel the American state to disinvest in its armed wing and invest in the social programs that may render the armed wing unnecessary. Determining a clear way forward for the movement for Black Lives has been complicated by the diffuse and decentralized nature of its organization and leadership. Moreover, the most powerful and largest eruptions of protest have not been organized by groups. The rebellion in Ferguson in 2014 that catalyzed the movement was not organized. The uprising in Baltimore some nine months later in the spring of 2015 was also not the work of any particular organization. And certainly the historic protests in the summer of 2020 were not the product of any kind of organizational strategy. Movement organizations interceded after to try and build out of these explosions. But the strategy has almost always been centered around winning reforms organized through public policy platforms. This has involved an orientation focused tightly around various kinds of electoral politics and elected officials. This has included meetings at the White House uh, during the Obama administration, joining White House initiated police commissions, it has involved appealing to the Democratic National Committee, 
the organizing uh, body of the Democratic Party, to include movement demands in the party platform uh, for the Democratic Party. In this way, some of the most influential actors within the movement have sought alliances within the state to win substantive reforms. To be sure, this strategy has netted some state-led reforms, changes that I described earlier, but they have also undermined the political independence of the movement, and those efforts have been wholly insufficient and thus triggered the questions about what is necessary to build a movement that can surpass the real but still anemic reforms that exist today. The reforms thus far have been anemic because movement organi organizations have not been able to harness the power of the street protests and rebellions that created the space for the movement in the first place. The issue at hand, especially as the Democratic Party moves to the right and seeks to abandon its connection to the movement for Black Lives, is how to build a mass movement that can pose a political and social threat to the status quo. But the question of the mass movement inevitably means building beyond the movement for Black lives. In the United States, African Americans can lead, but cannot alone sustain a movement that has the capacity to overcome the racism and class inequality that disproportionately impacts Black people. Not only are African Americans a statistical minority uh, within the United States at 13%, but the movement for Black lives, perhaps more than any other social phenomenon in two generations, has exposed and exacerbated class divisions within the Black population, making calls for unity untenable and raising strategic and political questions about the salience and efficacy of certain forms of political representation. What this has meant in real time is that in the summer of 2020, Black mayors, Black police chiefs, and Black police actively engaged in trying to thwart or repress the uprisings across the United States. In Chicago, the mayor, a Black lesbian, lifted drawbridges in downtown Chicago to protect the assets of the 1% who live in the city. In Atlanta, Georgia, the mayor used her status as a Black mother to compel young black people to leave the streets and go home. In Washington, DC, the black woman who led that city uh, painted a huge mural with the words Black Lives Matter while simultaneously working to build a new jail in the city. In Philadelphia, the black police chief, Danielle Outlaw, authorized the use of tear gas on uh, unarmed uh, nonviolent protesters. These were not moral failings, and these are only a few examples. These were not brothers and sisters who sold out the movement. These were class warriors who understood that their own proximity to power, ability to exercise power, and to ascend to greater heights of power depended on their ability to control unruly working class Black populations. Indeed, the former mayor of Atlanta emerged as a shortlist candidate for vice president for Joe Biden in the, in the 2020 election during that summer. Of course, that post eventually went to Kamala Harris, the former attorney general of California. Harris, it is worth remembering, made a name for herself in part by getting tough with black juveniles and pursuing a destructive law and order agenda. Solidarities with an emergent, powerful Black political class has been based in mutual histories that simply no longer exist. Of course, this class is still vulnerable to racist attack, as has become the new normal in American politics. But their proximity to power and their own aspirations for ascensions into the ruling class preclude the possibilities of coalition and mutual struggle. This is the added urgency to examine new formations and new coalitions to win the substantive changes that the movement seeks. This means thinking through the role and constituency of a mass movement that has the real capacity to coerce and pressure the American ruling class into substantively changing the conditions that undermine Black life. 
In the United States, it means envisioning a multiracial movement that unites a broad swath of marginalized, working class, poor, and oppressed people against a multiracial political class and an elite white economic class that deeply influence the direction of American politics. This is hardly a moral imperative. Instead, it is to come to the same conclusion that Martin Luther King did in 1966 after his efforts in Chicago failed to break through and defeat segregated uh, slum housing, police racism, and a host of other demands. The movement in Chicago largely failed because to challenge those conditions would require such a massive redistribution of wealth that neither political party on a national level and the Democratic Party on a local level were interested in making that kind of commitment. King then argued in 1966, quote, slums with hundreds and thousands living, slums with hundreds and thousands of living units are not as easily eradicated as lunch counters or buses are integrated. Jobs are harder to create than voting rolls. It is easy to conceive of a plan to raise the minimum wage and thus in a single stroke extract millions of people from poverty. But between the conception and the realization, there lies a formidable wall. Someone has been profiting from the low wages of Negroes. Depressed living standards for Negroes are structural or a structural part of the economy. Certain industries are based upon the supply of low wage, underskilled and immobile non-white labor. Hand assembly factories, hospitals, service industries, housework, and agricultural operations using itinerant labor would all suffer shock, if not disaster, if the minimum wage were significantly raised. A hardening opposition to the satisfaction of Negro needs must be anticipated as the movement presses against financial privilege. This is racial capitalism. This is the definition of systemic racism. This is also why systemic change is so difficult to accomplish. King's recognition of capitalism as at the root of the racism and inequality that shaped much of black life compelled him to imagine a mass movement of those with no real interest in this system. King of course was assassinated before his poor people's campaign was able to get underway. But his identification of the multiplicity the multiplicity of racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism as systemic, not superficial flaws in American society shifted the strategic orientation of the movement. Audre Lorde, when recalling the obstacles encountered by the Black movement of the 1960s, argued that to push through these obstacles in the 1980s required new ideas politics, new politics, and a willingness to do new things. She argued, and I quote at length, one of the most basic survival skills is the ability to change, to metabolize experience, good or bad, into something that is useful, lasting, effective. The 60s were characterized by a heady belief in instantaneous solutions. They were vital years of awakening, of pride, of era. The civil rights and black power movements rekindled possibilities for disenfranchised groups within this nation. Even though we fought common enemies, at times the lure of individual solutions made us careless of each other. Sometimes we could not bear the face of each other's differences because of what we feared those differences might say about ourselves. As if everybody can't eventually be too black, to white, to woman, to man. But the future vision, which can encompass all of us by definition, must be complex and expanding, not easy to achieve. The answer to cold is heat. The answer to hunger is food. But there is no simple monolithic solution to racism, to sexism, to homophobia. Within each one of us, there is some piece of humanness that knows we are not being served by the machine which orchestrates crisis after crisis and is grinding all our futures into dust. 
if we are to keep the enormity of the forces aligned against us from establishing a false hierarchy of oppression, we must school ourselves to recognize that any attack against Blacks, any attack against women, is an attack against all of us who recognize that our interests are not being served by the systems we support. Each one of us here is a link in the connection between anti-poor legislation, gay shootings, the burning of synagogues, street harassment, attacks against women, and resurgent violence against Black people. This was from a speech Audre Lorde gave in 1982. Lord Light like King was grappling with not only what is necessary for our movements to break through, but contemplating why the movements had not broken through. Today, we have seen in the US historic and unprecedented protests, followed by familiar patterns of backlash, retribution, and political retaliation, not just from the right, but from liberals just as vociferously in their own way. The challenge remains of building the mass movement against racist policing, but also the conditions that give rise to policing in the first place. These struggles are global because they stem from the entwined founts of slavery and colonialism, the foundations of racial capitalism. In all of our different geographies, nationalities, and contexts, we face ruling elites who hoard wealth and power while ruthlessly dividing the vast majorities to prevent the formation of solidarities and mutual struggle. The result is vast inequality, often justified by racism, religious bigotry, caste, nationalism, gender, sexuality. States across the globe then wield local police and utilize corrupted criminal justice systems to punish the victims of this inequality while managing and maintaining social inequality. This familiarity has produced empathic re recognition solidarity and a sense of connection that has been missing since the so-called third world movements of the 20th century. Our context and situations overlap and diverge. The bonds of internationalism have been frayed by the ascension to power by national liberation movements and then the undertaking, undertaking the naughty tasks of self-government and rule mitigated by the contingencies of debt, empire and post-colonial manip manipulations. So we have much to learn uh, from each other, but especially from the United States, we in the United States have much to learn, where imperial dominance and power can often lead to overgeneralizations or assumed expertise. At the same time, our histories and contexts are different, producing different political realities, different possibilities, which will ultimately shape our different strategies and tactics. But we do know that when any of our struggles find success and undermine state power, state logics, our movements everywhere can be boosted. And we also know that the bigger and more powerful those states, the more consequential, which was part of the power of the 2020 protests. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Suraj Yangdi. Okay, research associate of, uh, in the Department of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to utilize some minutes of the time I've been given to acknowledgments. I want to first of all acknowledge uh, the director of Sharjah Art Foundation, Sheikh Hur. I want to acknowledge the sweet email that Nidhi Mahajan sent, uh, which I couldn't resist to acknowledge. Also, Salah Hassan for engaging. Um, also, the staff, uh, Jinan Coulter, who's not here, but she's been assisting. Najiba, Shaima, Sana, and as well as the staffers who has been serving us, uh, who have been taking care of us from different countries. Uh, I, and, and their stories are also personally important for me. And especially, I want to acknowledge the toilet cleaners uh, who have been maintaining the sanitation, because that's the community I come from, India, that has been condemned to a hierarchical occupation. Um, Ahmed said, uh, if you sleep, it's OK. I want to say, if I sleep, please uh, uh, be OK, <laughs> because it's late in time as we speak. And, and, and the benefit of speaking at the last is to just say you, you acknowledge and you appreciate what they have said and you agree. Then you can go and, and sit. 
I did not know what to put the talk name, so I just came up with something creative, which is talk by Suraj Engde and in person. Um, there, are, there are many ways I thought I could address. You know, today what we'll do is um, we'll try to, you know, um, think about a couple issues that, has been, that have come up here. Um, but also I've been thinking constantly, and this question animates my political as well as, you know, academic engagements. Um, what will it take for a Dalit subject to, be, uh, to become a global subject? Uh, what is it that is prohibiting from Dalit humanity to be acknowledged on the same plane as other humanities that are politically important, relevant? Um, is it uh, because the Dalit presence is not there, partly a reason? But also, uh, there could be many more layers that have hindered the Dalit examination of society uh, to, be, uh, to be buried, and so we need to exhume uh, some of that. And uh, when I say the Dalit subjectivity, the former untouchables legalized uh, cruelty imposed upon them for three and a half thousand years, which Professor Gayatri Spivak was talking from her experiences as well, through the caste hierarchy that has retained a system uh, that is, uh, you know, just not notional. Uh, in when, I, when I talk about caste, I also mean to talk geographies of expanse, and I want to talk about national. Uh, so the culmination of notional and as well as national into making of a, of a certain humanity. And, and I've been thinking about this topic, about dialectical, you know, the whole process, the formation of modern uh, thought, especially, uh, if you can talk about Plato, but Hegelian engagement with the idea of dialectical as opposing as something more conversational. And I was thinking, um, I mean, there is particular aspect of what I would think about uh, uh, the position of Dalitical, what Dalit uh, position offers uh, in, in, in this case. I mean, I mean, it is a contesting space, uh, but it is, uh, it is, it is certainly um, uh, which, which engages with sensibility to rise, to, to make your uh, uh, nerves uh, engaged uh, within your own bodily uh, patterns. And, and it is, uh, I think, a method of reaching consciousness of shared wisdom. And we are all seeking for the final goal, uh, the apotheosis, the, the something that needs to be attained. And, and the, the mortification of, of, of a human body, the fear around what's going to happen, uh, that question is addressed by the enlightened one uh, in India, uh, the Buddha. Uh, and and I, I was thinking about the logic of metta, metta in commercialized bourgeois sense uh, from uh, uh, the Bay Area has become an accessible uh, 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 app on your iPhone and available on Play Stores for you to meditate for two and a half minutes and, and, and seek liberation in those terms. I don't mean to say by those uh, uh, accessible wisdom, but it's, it's a deep engagement with your own fears, with your own self, with your own darkness, but also uh, with your position into a society that Ambedkar, uh, in, in not absolute, but, but in, in certain terms, defined as the Navayana, the new vehicle of this Buddha's thought. And, 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 and this, uh, the position of the is, is, is limited, and uh, not necessarily to the engagements that I will go down and speak about, uh, with, within the human parenthesis, but also the non-human beings, which is also engaging and, 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 and producing uh, new lives. Uh, and, and so the position of the lyrical is certainly a dialectical nature of the thing and the being. It resists against single complexities of the conditions, but relies on the durational apotheosis of an original shared theology, which is a doctrinal endorsement of phenomena and experiences. It is a method of reaching consciousness of shared wisdom that I talked about. The dialectical positions itself in the multi-citational, and I say citational with the C, and multi morphobic convening that invites dialogue and compassion as a base of any theory. To reach a final goal pathway, pathways are set up. Uh, there is a, a way that you need to walk to achieve the, the final wisdom, uh, but the walking is not accessible to everyone. Um, uh, the dialectical approach is to start without imposed fears and insecurities of others, to find the common ground of flexibility and not rigidity, finding roots with OU and passages through the nothingness into creating of a new world order is the concern of the project of dialectical. However, it is not limited to the world. It is about finding the world in the community 
in the individual like lover of every seasons. This uh, position posits in between acting as a bridge to not reach conclusive dialectic, but be like nature, or if you will, water, that has a property of the world to survive without which we cannot, we cannot really exist. It is also having the property of moving, and also it is responsible for rising of civilizations. And, and in, in this uh, position, uh, what, what we need to also understand that when we, when we think about society, there are certain, certain frameworks that are not necessarily uh, approachable. Uh, and in, in today's context, what we are seeing uh, is the society is overwhelmingly decided uh, by, by, by this neoliberal uh, uh, jargon. Uh, and, and yesterday, uh, you know, we were talking, Zaid was talking also about this neoliberalism, and we have had this conversation around it. Um, um, uh, within the neoliberal cleavages, uh, where, where we have this new idea of, of diversity and trying to find easy solutions to the age-old problems, which is basically a two-minute Maggie Noodle type of solution, which, which doesn't really work in societies that have really not addressed their own issues. So I think what I feel is neoliberal cleavages have also produced neoliberal leakages. And what are those leakages? Uh, the, the empire uh, within, within a certain financial market, as well as cultural and religious market, uh, that continues to dominate, there are certain leakages within those own, there are pores that are existing within those chambers as well. And of course, when we talk about America, Black Lives Matter movement is one, but it is not the only one. The geography has to be decentered. We really need to look out for other experiments and other experiences. So I was appreciating Brother Ahmed talking about this, and I think these neoliberal leakages uh, that are existing amongst us needs to be, needs to be foregrounded. In, in this sense, um, uh, the, the, the rise of a new culture politics that has been uh, uh, debating with each other on the issues, uh, on, 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 on less material, but more on emotional sense. So, so neoliberalism, not just finding a global metropole or centers of finance, but also how I feel. Emotion has become a paradigmatic narrative of this new kind of uh, counter-revolution uh, that we see uh, in our time. This has given rise to also a diasporic uh, activism. Um, I, 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 I want to be respectful of this, but also I want to be, uh, uh, identify uh, about the identities uh, of, of conveniences that one can be in the diasporic spaces. And diasporic spaces operates in different nationalities, different contexts. I'm talking especially from the context of the, uh, the groups and, 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 and the figures I study, uh, where, where, where West or, or, that, or the local country where you are living becomes the, the primary channel of investigating or understanding your society. Uh, one, might, uh, one might have relatives of few generations from back home, but when, but when you become diaspora, it really becomes a, a dual responsibility to not fall into the trap of, of, of this uh, new wave of activism. And many times within the Dalit struggle as well, what we have noticed and across uh, different, different forums that I've observed uh, was, was uh, uh, the experiences of a whole society uh, is, is, is different certainly from the society that we study but the cultural experiences have so much meddled the imagination of you once imagined motherland uh, that that those uh, concepts which are hegemonic patronizing in abundantly uh, gets gets transposed and 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 so uh, there is there is a there is a accent privilege that operates. Uh, even in these spaces, uh, if you come in, in our part of the world, if you have a certain American or a British accent, you're almost a first class citizen right away without even qualifying, uh, having to qualify yourself. And I think this has penetrated into, 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 into what has become an identity of convenience. One can really jump on being a person of a certain color or certain identity, at the same time hold on to certain uh, locations of, of, of their own privileges. And so what has this done is this has created a peekaboo activism. You can hide and then immediately show whenever the, whenever the time has come. And such peekaboo activists exists amongst ourselves within the accent paradigms of the hegemonic order. And, and we need to really, we need, really need to find uh, various ways. And, and also, uh, there are limitations to concepts that were developed a century ago. Uh, in, in, in a new formulation, if we engage with the same uh, teleologies, then we might really uh, debate the same uh, uh, tiring adage of post-colonialism or, or subalternism. I think we need to, uh, that phase was a time. 
now this is a different, the 21st century has to have a new program for its own self. And, and, and these have to communicate and not with commodified ethnicities, what the Komarovs to talked about is ethnicity incorporated, where, where certain groups and certain cultures needed to be validated and, and assimilated in order to uh, find their original roots and, and, and purposes. And, and therefore I think the world communities cannot be designed into the frameworks. Uh, in, in, into certain brackets, uh, we all agree uh, that uh, the colonial experience and the colonial metaphors are not unifying force uh, either way, be it linguistic or be it a certain uh, certain jargon-based activism that it brought, that it brings. But with it comes to the Dalit community, uh, and I talk about this only through my experience, so I can't talk about others. Uh, it cannot be uh, dealt with pithy, clean. A reductionism of ideological chambers. Uh, you can be pure left, pure right, uh, pure centrist, pure liberal, uh, or pure environmentalist. Uh, this, this, these chambers that have been developed in this, in this order cannot be applied to certain groups because you have to deal with the original purpose of centering itself with someone else. You have to be the center of the dialogue that's taking place, where, of course, your centrality doesn't mean you are the principal agent, but you claim your agency that was not existing. And, and within this, uh, this, this neatness of having a societal uh, 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 recognition has, has really created uh, this, this new form of making. And that's why we cannot deal or adequately attack uh, the society by relying on mimicking of metaphors and stories that are not yours. We cannot uh, find certain hashtags to relay your cause. This, the neoliberal order has reduced one to really bring out your movement to be relevant, so you have to have a certain hashtag that, that rhymes with someone else's experience that has been existing. And, and, and this program has really not given access to the other communities who don't even know what hashtag means who doesn't even have access to certain technological innovations. And, and therefore, when we make those referential movements by solidarity, uh, we, 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 can, we can at best think of them as citations, but not the theories of mainstream of the groups that we chose to uh, represent. Um, the, the new uh, West-inspired uh, tautological national politics is also needs to be questioned. A society cannot be thought of as a national polity. Uh, today, we were talking about different groups and, and, and the subnationalisms that exist in, in, in these in the, in the, in the, groups. Uh, within this West-inspired, West is central, uh, and, and, and Western part of geography uh, can be part, but it cannot inform our imaginative cartography. Uh, and it's, it's not just uh, the notion of ideological thinking, but it is also how we build uh, the future. Today and erstwhile, when we talk about neoliberalism, it is not only the white man or the white woman. It's also your brown and black man and black woman occupying the same uh, positions at IMF and World Bank and other prestigious institutions, that also needs to be brought to order. Reductionism of a certain kind will certainly not give a, a place. And if you have to talk about global finance, we are in this country, in UAE and other parts of the Middle East. You can go to Russia, you can go to India, you can go to South Africa. You will notice uh, these new forms of surrogates operating in these financial markets. And if our critique has to come from that moment, we really need to find and bind more, 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 more theories. So how do we grapple or deal with the neoliberal categories that are, that are today, uh, which, which, is, which is not only limited to identity-based or, or certain pigmentation-based or certain caste-based or certain class-based, but these neoliberal categories are really, really what we could loosely call as micro-micro identities, which, which really is becoming a part of the mainstream sentiment. And, and, and in, in, in this, uh, the focus of, of, an, of, of, of a critique of a certain, in our case, it's a Brahminical critique, doesn't take place. Uh, Professor Spivak uh, confessed herself as a, a person coming from a Brahmin community whose ancestors have harassed my ancestors for those many thousands of years. And it took, I'm sure, a lot of time for her to come to that stage. Uh, uh, and, and there are many uh, Brahmins who operate. Uh, we will go very slowly to, to, that, to, that, to, that, to, that, to that position of how this new type of activism is not going to necessarily help. 
and, 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 and really uh, not uh, progress in, in many ways. And, and, and so for, for, for us, it's also about the non-human lives that collaborate. There is uh, flora and fauna, uh, the, the ecology that is part of it. One can talk about climate change in a capitalist language funded by uh, the billionaires who are responsible again to create a new alternative extraterrestrial life. But, but our existence has always been in collaboration. One does not need to cite that we are ecological or climate change activists. And what does mean? Animals subjugation is one of the best ways to justify human arrogance over the non-beings and we declare them as beasts. Beasts has many synonyms and few of them are savage, barbarian, animal, swine, pig, ogre, fiend, sadist, demon, devil. Now these are the terms that are also applied to my group if you, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you talk in a conversational or in referential sense. So there is hardly a difference between what we identify animal or here in what you identify as a human. The, the difference was never there because you were the same for a, for a certain hierarchical society where an oppressor was haunting you day and night. So the approaches to non-human life has to be, now there is a debate, there is a case that is going on in New York where an elephant I think the elephant's name is Lucy. There is, they are declaring if this elephant can be granted the status of a human. Now, what we really missed out, out in this debate is we are really still believing in the divides of animal and human. We are really trying to prioritize the beingness. And I think we really need to think, and, and I really uh, would like to uplift the idea thought through Heidegger what being, the Dazian, meant in a, in a philosophical construct which was, which was always trying to profess and trying to evolve in, a, in, a, in its own sense. And since caste is not necessarily a South Asian phenomenon, we really need to find out how caste exists within Arabic societies. I know some studies of Yemen, but there has to be much more robust analysis of what caste means. And, and, and I've been thinking about the, the underdogs of society, uh, the, the, the underrepresented of society. Uh, and, and these underrepresented are certainly uh, the groups that I call as, 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 as global caste. And, and what, what are one of those um, the, uh, defining uh, aspects of, and, and, and this can be something that might approach or appeal to one of you, enduring stigma, humiliation, striving for recognition as human, a fear of pollution uh, from the outcast, uh, there's strict endogamy, uh, minority status, spiritual ascent, bloodline through inheritance, control of the body politics as an accessible labor to be disposed, judicial and policial, uh, police officials, also known as the carceral state, in favor of maintaining caste supremacy, denying basic access to material and non-material resources through the state and, and laws. I, I think these are one of the uh, uh, few chambers that we need to perhaps look at when we are engaging a new form of politics. And therefore, we, we have to think not only against the idea of colonization or colonialism and the colonial concept like we have but also, we need to find out the histories and, uh, and, and presences of indigenous groups which might also have had such experiences. Now, the terminology might be different. We might call it something else. Like Brother Ahmed was saying, uh, uh, we, we don't call it in, in, in certain sense the societies that, that we have, but the experiences have been similar. We don't talk about these uh, pre-colonial existence. And so I would like to reduce colonialism to, uh, at least in India, the legalized colonization rule was 90 years. And now, if you ask me to spend my time for 90 years of rule of British, you are wasting my time and my ancestors' experiences and memories. I would rather go to the original archives of where we came from, where we informed, and what was the presence. I would like to end with this few artworks by the Dalit artists, where this Dalit artist um, actually, because Dalits were denied access to, uh, access to clean water, and, and, and this is a very interesting interface that the artist brings, where she collects uh, 108 ga uh, glass tumblers, where she's mixing this with cow dung, uh, cow urine, milk, ghee, and, and yogurt, and to really mix it and, and, just, and just approaching people uh, where there are two bottles in this, which consists of cow urine, which is considered more pure than a Dalit living in, 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 the, in the household. The other is about the broken food, the food. This is the existence and emblematic of caste system. Dalits are the feet, 
and yet they are broken when they are feet. So they can't even stand on themselves because their position has always been broken by the, by the time they've been uh, taking birth. And this is my friend Sajan Mani, another artist, who described uh, this as caspital. Uh, uh, a very an interesting interface to describing how capital uh, uh, takes a position, and of course he 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 is that's that's his artwork, and and this this coat is something is, is something very inspires. Uh, we can see probably. So by a by a by a liberationist from the Dalit community was born a slave, and that year is 1879 in South India. Not a single letter is seen on my race. So many histories are seen on so many races. Scrutinize each one of them, the whole of the world, not a single letter is seen on my race. And that's the kind of erasure we are talking about. And so today what we have is the slave owners are your colleagues in colored nationalism project or as person of colors. That's the big contradiction I want to leave you with where we have to really grapple uh, these positions. I just wanted to finally end with this is the family photo, and there is a reason I'm showing. So there is one, there is illiterate, there is literate, there is semi-literate, and educated, whatever, two PhDs, whatever. And, and, and in this is, I mean, none of them understand. And, and, and my grandma, who I talk about in the book, uh, is reading. This is the source. Uh, and, and so for me, if I have to find an anchor, I better go into uh, the original source where I draw my inspiration, and that's been the ancestral heritage that we all have. We don't need to really find me making orders. I thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, not bad for five speakers we did marathon. Uh, I'm not going to summarize everybody's talk, but I'm just going to say, and then hopefully all of you guys will, uh, will include it in your responses from the Q&A. Uh, I just want, to uh, my observation, the, the question of solidarity over artists, everyone's talks, even Shuraj's uh, Dalit and uh, dialectic, which that is, and the meta of that, and um, pick, oh, whatever, uh, pick, pick whatever was the activism, I forgot. Anyway, uh, qu questions of solidarity over arts to everybody, although differences on sustainability of solidarity uh, surfaced. Uh, Russell seems to think that. Um, BLM or Black Lives Matter galvanized uh, solidarity throughout, and he thinks of the promises of solidarity on, on new, um, uh, what he called new internationalism. I've heard you say that when Nura Ekrat talked too. Uh, and Professor, but Professor Kianga talked about uh, the urgency for new formation and, and, and new coalition, new social movement because of the backlash that the, the Black Lives Matter movement has been confronted with. Um, so my question is, and then I hope you, you guys include it in your uh, responses. I mean, in the 60s, solidarity was a totally different game uh, because of maybe, you know, there was a, an ideology behind it, an ideology perhaps of Marxism-Leninism, perhaps of Pan-Africanism that brought, or, or Pan-Arab solidarity or whatever, that brought a whole lot of, I mean, the mar marginal subjects together. But can the solidarity, every time a movement rises, there is a, a galvanization of uh, the social movement all over and then it dies down. Can, can that solidarity today, short of ideology or short of uh, what, uh, what, what can bring us together, sustain or survive? So that's my question. Hopefully you can include it in, my, in, um, in, uh, in the question and answer. So I'll take question and answer. Um, okay, Pramesh, uh, one. Thank you very much, that was an exhilarating panel. But I have a very specific question and I want us to, to ask if we could un unpack this idea of racial capitalism. Because it does seem to me that there's a shift in the concept of work, in the way in which immaterial labor, for example, has taken hold of the kind of imagination, the global imagination, and the way in which it has reconstituted categories of race and the relationships between race and capital. So I wondered if you could say a little bit about you know, what we want, what work we want racial capitalism to do in this conjuncture. Okay, can I, oh, can I start with uh, Professor Rickford or Professor Kianga? My, my, 
Ma I feel good. Mahata. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can I start with you, Russell? Did you get the question? Did you get the question, Russell? Uh, they didn't get the question. Oh. Are they? Are they all? Okay. Can you, you guys want to stop? <laughs> Russell, can you hear me? Okay, did you get the question? Did you get the question? Okay, can you make, get a stab at it? What? You're on mute, Russell. Can you, can, can, you're on mute. Russell, you're on mute. Okay, now you're on. I'm sorry, I, I think I, I, I don't think I could hear most of that. So I, I did hear a question um, about uh, ideology. I heard a question about uh, racial capitalism. Okay, the question is uh, like perhaps yeah. what he meant, what you meant by racial capitalism, right? Yes. Sh should I speak to that? Yes, can, yes. Can, so I just, can I just clarify? I want to ask what work we want racial capitalism for us to do today because in some sense something has shifted in the nature of work that has reconstituted the way we think of the combination the combinatory form race and capitalism or the or racial capitalism so i'm, I'm just wondering what you know it, it's been referenced at various points and i just want to know if if the shift in the nature of work means that we want r the configuration racial capitalism to do a different kind of work for us in this conjuncture yeah thank you uh, so I'm not um, I, I think that uh, this phrase racial capitalism can translate uh, in uh, in different ways in different contexts I have to say um, here in the US uh, I think uh, and and in other places I think that it functions as a kind of shorthand um, and when uh, people on the left use racial capitalism, uh, quite often it is a, a way of encompassing an analysis and a perspective and a uh, position um, that uh, tries to um, uh, uh, acknowledge the uh, historical um, uh, 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 linking um, of uh, uh, processes of, um, of capitalist accumulation uh, and racial formation. So, I mean, racial capitalism has, you know, as a, as a phrase, as an analytic, has some very sort of specific um, origins and, uh, and genesis. Um, you know, scholars like Robin Kelly uh, and, and others um, have, uh, have discussed this, um, uh, you know, thinkers like, um, you know, Cedric Robinson helped to uh, uh, popularize it, at least in, uh, in, in, in the United States within and beyond the uh, academy, um, you know, borrowing it from South African uh, 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 scholars. But I mean, I think, you know, for me, um, when I say racial capitalism, it's a way of uh, intervening in uh, debates uh, on the uh, left about, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of the relative significance of, uh, of race and class. And it's a way of gesturing to um, uh, an analysis and understanding and, and acknowledgement um, of the mutually constitutive uh, you know, realities of, uh, of our oppression. Um, it doesn't really uh, get you out of jail entirely uh, <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, ongoing uh, debates, uh, but I actually think the popularization of the language um, of uh, racial capitalism beyond the uh, academy uh, and in social movements uh, um, is, um, is, is uh, quite positive. Um, and to the extent that you know, I think, you know, uh, both Kianga and I were trying to gesture to perhaps some of the positive 
um, uh, elements, positive legacies of BLM, part of it is that um, BLM, you know, unevenly, imperfectly, um, but it did help to uh, popularize a kind of um, anti-racist uh, analysis that um, was rooted in uh, in history, was rooted in a in a critique of uh, of power, um, and was rooted in you know sort of a structural critique of um, of economic exploitation that included an an, an awareness of class. And these were all um, uh, um, sort of analytical uh, paradigms that were uh, erased or marginalized uh, among many progressives and even uh, many leftists um, in the context of, you know, the Obama years, right? Um, so I don't know what uh, what Kianga would add to that, and I'm not sure if that gets to the question of. Um, the kind of work that we want racial capitalism to do. So I'll just um, I'll just say quickly. So I know there's a time issue. Um, I agree with uh, how Russell has characterized the kind of larger context, but then uh, which racial capitalism is uh, its more recent deployment um, in 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 the U.S. I I also think that. Um, the work that racial capitalism is doing is still uh, viable and um, uh, uh, tangible, uh, which is to say that uh, in, the, in the US in particular, uh, there's a way in which um, uh, race is still powerful uh, in uh, extractive practices uh, from the state and private capital. There's a way in which uh, race is still um, uh, leveraged uh, in ways that both extract from black and brown communities, uh, but also uh, is leveraged against um, ordinary uh, white people and the uh, amount of money that people are willing to pay uh, to escape uh, from black people to to uh, get away from um, black families, and so mostly this has to do uh, with real estate, um, where racial capitalism and the ability uh, to leverage race as a a factor in the development and creation of value um, is still quite powerful. And I think that the observations of King, even if some of the technical uh, categories of work have changed is still uh, important. Um, in the U.S., the, uh, the way in which uh, lower uh, wages and salaries of Black people have become normalized uh, is often unfortunately seen as a benefit uh, to white people when the real beneficiaries of uh, this arrangement um, are the stewards of capital. Uh, and so those uh, uh, uneven um, patterns of development that are encouraged and pursued by capital that manifest themselves in terms of lower wages, lower standards of living, higher costs uh, uh, of housing um, are the ways in which racial capitalism uh, continues to function and be viable um, in the United States. And so even where, uh, you know, some of the, the, the questions of uh, labor, you know, may transform over time, but I think the basic um, dynamics of uh, exploitation um, and work, you know, are still intact and facilitated uh, in, in some ways by uh, the, um, the dynamics of uh, racial capitalism. Uh, I'm just going to come in, and if I'm wrong, I want Sur, my brother Suraj to correct me. So I think that caste is a very specific example of racialized capitalism, because you extract labor from somebody of the oppressed caste based on what caste they are. So the shudras, who are the, you know, the bottom of the caste hierarchy, are meant to do all sorts of menial labor. But there is a shudra who must do the job of cleaning. There is a shudra who must do the job of cultivation. There is a shudra who must, and which is what I think Dr. Ambedkar captured this essential aspect of capitalism embedded in caste by saying, 
caste is not a division of labor, it is a division of laborers. So I kind of think, Suraj. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> okay, the gentleman over there, yeah, you have uh, the microphone. My question's for Suraj and Meena. Um, you know, after the keynote yesterday by Gayatri, and she's famously known to have said uh, as a critique of subaltern studies that developed uh, in, in India especially, um, to kind of critique the, the metropolitan post-colonialism in subaltern studies of basically the class, compos the, the class composition of a lot of subaltern studies scholars and luminaries, that they're actually missing the point of if I can reduce it uh, to something between the rural and urban divide and kind of the, the rural subject becomes the object of study um, for a lot of the thinkers of say subaltern studies. But I think in more recent times, we're seeing, um, we're, we're seeing something which is, not, which is not guilty of, no, not dismissive of urban critiques, urban voices uh, that are coming with uh, uh, positions of caste struggle and, or anti-caste uh, struggles, yeah? So what I wanted to ask was, even say in uh, Professor Spivak's presentation yesterday, she left us with this subject that is a, a victim of all of the kinds of racial, caste, and capitalist oppressions. And the subject is primarily located in some rural kind of a context. Um, um, so how do you both um, see the location of, of voices, the location of the struggle across the rural urban kind of divide that the previous generation was making, you know? Because there was a kind of divide between the rural and urban that was being made when critiquing subaltern studies. Uh, I, I wouldn't have much to add to your comment, uh, but I just personally think that uh, these divisions uh, are not as talk, and also it, you have to call into question what causes this division. For instance, in a lot of places, there's been a systematic land grab from the Dalit people that has lasted a lot, at least two centuries, if not more. When there is systematic land grab, making them one of the most landless populations in India, they definitely have to migrate. Second, what has happened to the Dalit communities is a list of caste atrocities. So I, I have a friend, from, a Marathi friend, who says to me that people were fleeing the Kilvin Mani massacre and settling in Dharavi. So what makes someone a rural, landless, agricultural, untouchable laborer in Tanjavur ends up being a migrant worker in Dharavi slum in Mumbai, which is an urban center. So these are not two unrelated people. It is basically systems of oppression which make them. But there is also constantly, um, like I visited this atrocity zone uh, in Dharmapuri 2012, uh, where 300 homes of Dalit people were burnt because of uh, inter-caste love marriage between a Dalit man and a, a dominant caste woman. And the population is a migrant population. They go, work in Bangalore, come back, and then they become rural, you know, when they are back. So I don't know if the division is so strict, but Suraj? No, you see, I think the binary of rural-urban uh, was, uh, you know, wasted the time of uh, thinkers, and an entire generation was trapped in this booty trap, you know. Uh, what, what it essentially did was, is to create a new subject, uh, which was amenable uh, in a logic of Althusserian, uh, ways of you know understanding society, you know, and um, incidentally, uh, the people who wrote about this had the first kiss of colonialism in India, right, from the Bengali. So, so we we really also have to understand that there is, has been a particular history uh, to 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 that fragment of of, and um, this has also happened across the spectrum of the second half of the past century whenever you see academic language being created or you know, inspirations being drawn, subaltern studies is not the exception. And you know, the work it did was great, but it was incomplete. And only now, the subaltern studies people, uh, personally to me, they have told that you know, they missed out a, a, a big plot that was, you know. So when we understand a society, we have to, you know, we have to look at uh, the culture of, of each society. What is the culture about? In India, it's a caste culture. In somewhere else, it might be something else. I don't know what it is called. 
context, maybe tribal, maybe the ethnic formulations, whatever it, it might be. Um, and and if, if, we, if we theorize a society based on that, and now incidentally also uh, almost all uh, formulators of this discipline from the subcontinent were Brahmins. If not Brahmins, they were Brahmin convert Muslims. So they were still Brahmins. They just had a name, Muslim name, but they were from the convert caste groups. So what we saw in this uh, uh, project uh, was a new uh, uh, philosophy that they were trying to propose, which, which didn't really provide an adequate solution. It really made good academic departments. Even now, students write theses on postcolonialism, and I, I ask them what is there more to write about, which must be there. I mean, literary canon can do that, you know. But also in anthropology and historiography, uh, we really need to reorient, and I think this generation needs to be educated on that across the board. This generation uh, within different geographical locations have to be told that this is also the new question you need to posit, or else what it happens is what happens uh, with the question of race, uh, you know, uh, or, or what happens with the question of gender. It is always has to compete with something else. To, to, to emphasize, uh, and, and, and I think we haven't seen yet, and, for, and this is also, I wrote about it also, the cultural suicide bombers uh, within the dominant castes, especially in our case, the Brahmins, who can really privilege their location and, and write about it. So one of my qualms with this new disciplinary uh, frameworks uh, was that it forced me to think of myself as a subject of a class, which I already am, but only think you sell yourself as a subject of a European colonization, uh, which, 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 uh, which is okay if I'm meeting an elite from African society whose parents have been benefited from the colonization. I mean, let, let there not be misconceptions that they were handlers of colonial officials as well. And it is their children and progenies uh, who are at the front of reclaiming certain forms of decolonization or post-colonization. We, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the people who are like me, who are cleaning the toilets, whose ancestors were toiling on the field, who were really having no means anyway. And these canons made sure that I become irrelevant when I will write my job application, when I will write my statement of purpose, because my experiences are not understandable or readable to the people who is assessing me. Okay, great. So, um, I take two more questions because we're running out of time. So. Two more, we started late, we have uh, many speakers, so where? Okay, whoever, okay, yes, please. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, well thank you so much for this um, excellent panel. Um, I've just, it's been so much that's been said. I think my question, or I'll first kind of frame uh, what I've been thinking. You know, I appreciate the cultural understanding shifts that have happened because of Black Lives Matter. Uh, especially in the U.S., um, and it's heartening to hear about some of the associations or maybe strengthening of existing collaborations, like uh, I think um, Dr. Russell talked about African Americans and Palestinians. Um, but I'm curious about the global shifts when it comes to systemic racism, anti-oppression, uh, the global apartheid systems, and like really how strong are the global leaderless, anti-race, anti-caste, um, anti-oppression systems. And I know, you know, we just heard a comment that was saying that these are very distinct struggles in different countries and they have different flavors and different expressions, um, different political uh, specific kind of domestic challenges. But I think this kind of goes to uh, the moderator when you were bringing up the point about solidarity and what does sustainable solidarity look like? In the civil rights era, you know, decolonization, African liberation, anti-apartheid movements, they were really strengthened through the international and cross-community engagements. And there were actually hubs of decolonization that weren't just, you know, theoretical or rhetorical. And I, I really love the, um, the term of peekaboo activism because it's so easy to do, especially now on Twitter. You know, we can say a hashtag and SARS and institutional police violence, but where are the real, you know, invested opportunities to make those linkages between police violence in Nigeria, Brazil, and the U.S., and also cross topically, right? Like we're 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 still in a, a day and age where vaccines can be hoarded, while people well, where a, a real pandemic is going on, and um, people don't have access to them. So yeah, I'm just curious to like, what does it take to have a sustainable, operational, perhaps a lobbying 
system that helps us to maintain these uh, global systems of uh, anti-oppression. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And that was my question too. How do we form a global solidarity movement these days? Like short of ideology, short of something bringing us together, a larger, a larger thing than the activism itself, the, 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 you know, the momentary activism itself. What, what, what's gonna bring us together? The 60s were different. There was Bandung, there was the, you know, the, the, the civil rights movement, there was the women's movement. So that brought everybody together to make the movement sustainable. You know, so, but these days they're so fragmented, they're so fractured, and they just die down after, you know, Kianga was saying two years after, what's happening now? Critical race theory in the United States is being banned, you know? So how do we sustain that movement? What is the global solidarity that ties up together? Thank you for asking that question. So Russia and Kianga, if you can address that, and everybody actually, huh? Yeah, thanks for that. I, you know, I, oh. I, I'm, 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 I didn't I'm even very give you the floor. Of, uh, <laughs> Where are you? Oh, there. Okay. okay. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, should I continue? Uh, uh, my question may be relevant to the same. Uh, or can you hear me? One more. Let me take one more question. Okay, just one more question. I thought you were saying. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Oh. Uh, so my question is that. Uh, uh, if uh, India is a caste culture, and like a COVID, it was a local and it becomes a global problem, and the Indians are moving everywhere, uh, you can find either in the colleges, universities, or the employment, or uh, in the government, uh, then this caste culture can be a global problem. And the, so what should be the, some kind of you know, uh, global move for this? Thank you. Russell, now you can, and then Kianga can go. Russell, can you hear us? Hello. <laughs> Russell, can you hear us? Can you hear? I can hear you now. Okay, uh, can you go ahead? I, I think Do, okay, go ahead. Yes. So um, I, I, I was I was going to say I'm 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 very uh, careful about cautious about. Um, you know, sort of over romanticizing uh, 1960s solidarity and internationalism, because I, I think that um, those movements, whether we're talking about Pan-Africanism, whether we're talking about uh, Marxist-Leninist movements, decolonial movements, anti-imperialist movements, I think uh, they experience um, many of the same issues of, of fragmentation, um, you know, the sort of uh, questions of, uh, ideological consistency, the problems of, of elite capture. I mean, many of the things I think we're talking about um, uh, today, I, I, certainly there were differences. I mean, when you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the level of, of, of the state, um, uh, uh, you know, anti, you know, sort of real uh, uh, institutional apparatus of anti-imperialism and uh, you know, whether you're talking about Algeria or Cuba or, uh, you know, other other uh, sort of um, government infrastructure um, to to bolster and provide, you know, the, the, the framework for these kind of solidarities and the, and the actual, um, you know, sort of physical meetings uh, and and and, you know, mingling that's essential to building, you know, solidarity from below. I think that was important, and in the absence of much of that today, I think that's part of the reason we find ourselves flailing um, for some sort of concrete basis for sustaining these movements. And I think that uh, you know, Kianga's raised one of the one of the critical questions, right? How do we um, sustain these, sustain and deepen these movements, right, in ways that are uh, actually become uh, you know threatening um, to the to 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 structural oppression? Uh, and I would just say briefly. Um, you know, within the United States, um, I have been somewhat heartened to see the proliferation uh, within the context of, of, of BLM and other sort of grassroots democratic movements, uh, including, um, you know, wildcat strikes, uh, more sort of radical environmental movements, et cetera. I've been heartened to see um, the proliferation of 
uh, what I call kind of grassroots, um, you know, counter institutions. Um, sometimes it can be, uh, you know, people's assemblies um, uh, at the level of, of uh, communities or neighbors, neighborhoods. Sometimes something even as uh, modest as, um, you know, community gardens, uh, urban gardens, um, attempts to create, uh, you know, liberated zones. Um, in, in the United States, there's such a, um, there's so little uh, uh, sort of tradition sustained tradition of organizing on the uh on the left uh, and now with you know the sort of decimation of 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 a kind of a uh you know uh firm trade union um uh you know infrastructure then people are really sort of um flailing about for a kind of institutional apparatus for spaces where uh we can not only develop sort of you know, independent um, social critiques, but begin to act on them systematically where people's consciousness can be uh, transformed and they can begin to, um, uh, to, to um, you know, kind of engage in, um, in, in practices of, of uh, anti-racist um, and anti-capitalist solidarity. So um, for me, I think that's, uh, that's a start. Uh, it's not enough to sustain um, maybe the most progressive, the most anti-capitalist, the most internationalist elements of um, uh, uh, of Black Lives uh, Matter. I do think that we have to uh, build an infrastructure uh, on the left um, uh, that includes, you know, rebuilding uh, uh, trade unions. Um, and within the United States, I believe it has to happen well beyond uh, the Democratic Party, as as Kianga suggested. Yeah, I'll just add um, to that. Uh, to me, there there are a couple of things. One is that, you know, I can only speak from my own uh, experience and, and scholarship here in the United States, but we haven't achieved that level of solidarity um, internally <laughs> within, you know, this, uh, this one context of uh, the U.S. I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement is uh, is is really not just the Black Lives Matter movement, but this whole past period of Trumpism, which on the one hand produced the largest number of demonstrations in American history, beginning with the Women's March uh, in January of 2017, where between three and six million people uh, took part in demonstrations that were against Trump to more protests in that four year period, uh, eventually punctuated by the protests in 2020 than any other point in American history. And out of that, very few linkages, connections between different um, social movements were uh, formed, even within the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, where there has been an emphasis on uh, decentralization, diffusion, um, and a rejection of any formalized leadership. We all know that leaderships uh, exist, but they exist without accountability um, and any kind of formal uh, uh, role. Uh, there's no cohesion between those groups. So to, the idea to go from the extraordinary fragmentation within the United States to then uh, you know, global solidarities uh, doesn't really take into account um, the, uh, the 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 fractures, the the realness, the the, the concreteness of the the uh, fractures and fissures that exist uh, here um, in the first place. Uh, and there, you know, there are all kinds of reasons for that. I think we have to talk about the role of NGOs um, and the 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 way that they help to constitute uh, silos, the way that they encourage. Uh, the uh, kinds of uh, tensions um, between different movements and, and different struggles. And my suspicion is that that's not just a local context, but that that is probably a global context uh, as well. The pr proliferation of uh, philanthropic, uh, monetary uh, 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 power, uh, the you know, uh, uh, exploitation of, of management by uh, NGOs um, in the uh, last 40 years might have something to do with that also. And, you know, I would say just finally, I don't think we can just say the 60s was one thing. What about today? I think we have to see a relationship uh, between those two. 
um, which is to say that uh, if in the 60s that part of what bound these different groups in different contexts together uh, was that you had ex ex people who were excluded uh, vying for positions uh, of, of leadership uh, and who saw some commonality uh, in different con countries and different contexts between those struggles. And that was part of the basis of, um, of solidarity uh, between uh, groups in the US, groups in, uh, um, uh, in, in anti-colonial situations in, um, in Africa, across Asia, uh, if that was part of the basis of foundation, what does it mean for those uh, formerly excluded groups to rise into positions uh, of power? Um, and how does that alter uh, the relationship? How does that alter um, the need for, for solidarity, the desire uh, for, for solidarity? Um, I'm not particularly sure. I mean, this is what I was trying to get at with what does it mean for national liberation movements to come uh, into power? And how does that change the dynamics between their relationships um, uh, to not just groups within um, the, the, the countries of which they are now ostensibly leading, but how does that change their relationship uh, to other groups of formerly uh, excluded uh, people who are also aspiring to positions of power or who have achieved them? And I think that that has to be part of our analysis of what has happened to the um, uh, kind of uh, solidarities that were uh, a feature, even with all of their contradictions and problems, but that still existed, that were a feature of the 1950s and 60s um, and the, 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 the 70s. What happened uh, to them? How do we understand that in the context of moving from exclusion uh, to political uh, inclusion as part of our assessment? Thank you. On that note of solidarity, we part today. Um, thank you, the speakers. Thank you, Russell and Kianga, for joining us remotely. And thank you that you guys are here. Bye.